Hey everybody, welcome to my show for drummers only. Today we're going to have a look at Karen Carpenter. Karen Carpenter was born in 1950 and she died in 1983. You know, I began to make a review of the Carpenters for Mid-Rock Crisis, but I stopped. The story was too sad. So wrong, I didn't feel like I could get into the eating disorder that took her life. You know, that's a matter of psychology, and what do I know? But not only was she a thoroughly blessed and gifted vocalist, she's a damn good drummer. I have heard that if she had pursued the drums, the tragedy of her stardom could have been managed but she was just too good. She's just too good. Karen and brother Richard Carpenter formed the pop duo, The Carpenters. They hailed from New Haven, Connecticut and moved to Downey, California with her family in 63. That's a suburb of Los Angeles. She studied drums in high school. She also sang in the Long Beach State Choir. As the Carpenters, they toured Southern California at any venue available. Karen was the drummer, Richard was the front man. It was discovered that Karen had a velvety contralto voice which came to the fore in the studio with multi-tracking. She could continue her drumming, but of course, this was the time of the glass ceiling. Drumming wasn't ladylike. Her older brother Richard was also a gifted prodigy on piano. Their father had been a missionary in China. At four, Karen took tap dancing and ballet lessons. When the family moved to California, Karen was 14 years old. Then in high school, she was younger than her classmates. She joined the school marching band where she was given the glockenspiel. Those are the bells. An instrument she disliked. She asked if she could instead play drums. Her friend and classmate Frank Chavez was a drummer who admired Buddy Rich. He helped to convince Karen's parents to invest in a set of Ludwigs for Karen. He began to teach her to play. She liked Joe Morello and learned to play complicated 5-4 time signatures. She majored in music at Long Beach State College with Richard and they both sang in the choir there. Her first band was called Two Plus Two. The trio in 1965, and next was the Richard Carpenter Trio with bassist Wes Jacobs. They played jazz in various nightclubs, and they were signed by RCA. In 66, the Carpenters were invited to audition for bassist Joe Osborne, a member of the infamous studio music group The Wrecking Crew. Osborne was the one who first saw Karen as a singer out in front of the drums. He offered her a job, but Richard was not included. In 1967, Jacobs left to study at Juilliard. Karen was pleased to now include her brother. They formed the band Spectrum and focused on harmony. Their sound was too dissimilar to the psychedelic rock that was currently in vogue. A&M signed them in 69. Karen was both the drummer and co-vocalist. She sung her parts from behind the drum set. And this is critical in her story. Karen Carpenter sang most of the songs on the Carpenter's first album. It was first named offering, but the title was changed to Ticket to Ride after the Beatles cover on the album. Richard wrote 10 of the 13 songs, and Karen also played bass on two songs. 
another example of the bass being really a rhythm instrument. In the types of bands I've been in, open mic and party bands that is, a single most important factor in comparing good bands to not so good bands, check to see if the bass and drums are in sync. The Beatle cover was released as a single, charted to number 54 in the US. Here's the songs on that album. Uh, one, Invocation. Two, Your Wonderful Parade. Three, Someday. Four, Get Together. Five, All My Life. Six, Turn Away. Seven, Ticket to Ride. Of course, that's the Beatles cover. Eight, Don't Be Afraid. Nine, What's the Use. Ten, All I Can Do. Eleven, Eve, 12, nowadays Clancy can't even sing, that's a Neil Young cover, and Benediction. Their next album was Close to You, and it featured two singles, They Long to Be Close to You, and We've Only Just Begun, and they were one and two on the U.S. charts, and they are unforgettable. Karen was persuaded by Richard and their management to stand at the microphone to sing the hits. She had felt comfortable singing from the drummer's throne, so she struggled with live shows because now people were looking at her as a singer because, including looking at her body. Of course, she had nothing to fret since she was five foot four, thin and slinky, but she did fret because deep in her self-consciousness she thought that she was fat. This is not an imagined thing. Women have been pressured to present the median between fat and thin, tall and short, blonde or red, long hair or short hair, and other comparisons for centuries. The early 70s was no different. If you wanted to be liked, you had to look right. And Karen didn't think she was good enough. She could play well enough. She was a terrific drummer and she knew her voice was nice, even beautiful. But her own body became her enemy. Now that she was on TV without the drums between you and your audience, her only option, she thought, was to get thinner. And no matter how thin she got, she still thought she was too heavy and, and she didn't reserve. I meant she didn't deserve. She felt to be a star. You know, and it killed her. Her heart stopped. It was a slow, slow slide to suicide and it takes a lot of therapy to find cover recovery from an eating disorder and Karen had no time for that at that point. The music biz is demanding and puts pressure on an artist to make more hits. More, more, more. It's never enough. So you still want to be an entertainer folks? Or other protective entity, her brother, got addicted to quaaludes. If you're curious about what that's like, read the novel Ludes, a ballad of the drug and the dream by Ben Stein. It's a fascinating tour of the awful underbelly of the culture we know as Los Angeles. You can't put it down. The point here is that suddenly no one was looking out for Karen. No matter how thin she became, her voice would stay the same. And that's how her story played out. And she was lost. There's more to be said about anorexia nervosa. Suffice for now to say that Karen Carpenter's tragedy brought media attention to the condition as it had been widely unknown before the 70s. 
and this may be her best legacy. And here's her studio albums, Offering in 69, uh, Close to You, uh, Carpenter 71, come on Karen, load up, A Song for You in 72, Now and Then in 73, Horizon in 75, A Kind of Hush in 76, Passage in 77, Made in America in 81, and Love Lines, which was a posthumous release. And as time goes by, 2001 was also posthumous. Here's the songs. One, Without a Song. Two, Superstar, Rainy Days and Mondays. Three, Nowhere Man, that's a Beatles cover, of course. Four, Got Rhythm Medley. Five, Dancing in the Streets. Six, Dizzy Fingers. Seven, You're Just in Love. Eight, Medley. Nine, California Dreamin'. It's a Mamas and Papas cover. Ten, The Rainbow Collection. Eleven, Close Encounters slash Star Wars Medley. Twelve, Leave Yesterday Behind. Thirteen, Carpenter's Hits Medley. And 14, and when she smiles, I suspect that these songs, especially these medleys, did not become born that way. They were assembled in the studio after, either after Karen got really, really popular or possibly after she died. So anyway, thank you for being with me for this sad segment on For Drummers Only. I'll be back soon. Meantime, you all take good care.